What a complete and utter failure. I don't even know where to begin. There's just so much. It's overwhelming, honestly. I guess I'll start from the beginning and work my way through this... dread sheep of a title. Being released in closed beta on the 31st of May 2012, and going into open beta a year later, on the 7th of July, Smite's major selling point was that the camera was in the third-person perspective, getting the players closer to the action than any other MOBA on the market, that and being able to choose various gods from a variety of mythologies. Each of these gods fit into the five typical roles that are found in MOBAs. You probably already know them. But what modes you can play? Well, at release there were two, Arena and Conquest. And so, from the very start, it was decided that the game would forever have a divided player base. I wish I could say I was kidding, but I'll explain them quickly. Conquest is the standard MOBA map, complete with three lanes and a jungle. On release, the jungle was huge, but over time this was ironed out to more match its competitors. The ultimate objective of this mode was to destroy a Minotaur protected by three structures. This was slightly unique, however, since the Minotaur could fight back, even walking to the centre of the map to battle with the other team's Minotaur if the matches went on for too long. The former would remain in every iteration of Conquest. The latter did not. Now onto Arena. Almost acting as the antithesis of Conquest, the main goal here was to simply eliminate the enemy minions and gods to reduce a ticket counter. When one team's counter reaches zero, the other wins. I'm sure you can see why Arena would pose a promising threat to the population of the Conquest player base. While Conquest provides a longer, much more tactical experience, Arena simply gave players a quick and easy rush without having to use their brain too much. So yeah, like I said earlier, Conquest was unironically doomed to be second best from the very start. That still wouldn't affect the balance of the game, however, as high res still made adjustments for Conquest first. Or they'd like us to believe that anyway. Also, yes, I have been showing you real gameplay footage this whole time. The game honestly did look like this at some point, but apart from using a colour palette stuck between Demon Souls and the inside of my toilet rim, the art direction in Smite's earliest phases was pretty different to how it would eventually evolve. The maps in beta had almost cartoon-like shrubbery and trees being rounded and tall. The walls that create the barriers for each lane are crumbling and in ruin, all with a less saturated colour palette that gives off a dreary appearance. Man, I haven't even mentioned the jungle. Those colours paired with the dense fog making it look more similar to a demented dreamscape? Truly a place where the gods have abandoned their care of the earth to fight each other instead. It was surprisingly unique, and dare I say, daring? Characters themselves were the opposite, most likely an intentional choice to make them more visible while playing. The old god designs were very saturated, and almost silly in some areas. Speaking of silly, uh, yeah, that UI. Okay, it's in closed beta, and I'm being mean, but it does look incredibly cheap and also a little confusing. The old Smite logo and HUD in general used really bright colours that hurt my eyes and clash against the rest of the art direction. That's probably just because yellows require more work to look nice, something that gold struggles less with, likely the reason why the artwork slowly developed more towards that colour. Something that isn't lacklustre, however, would be the music. Oh my lord, the music is so intense, like, uh, seriously, I'm just picking a character. I'm not fighting Virgil with three bars of health. Why is everything so scary here all of a sudden? I would say the OST is one of Smite's best aspects. From the previous example of the God Selection theme, to the start of a match where it just builds up and up and up, almost as if it's encouraging you to play at your very best. Even the main menu stands out. That choir, man. But enough about something that most people would consider irrelevant. What about the actual gameplay? 
The way the game plays is exactly the same to how it is today. All the attacks you have require precise aiming to land, and movement is far easier compared to something like League of Legends or Dota, providing gameplay which gives players immediate feedback and arguably a more rewarding gameplay experience due to the increased skill requirement. That loop hasn't really changed over the years, so from here I'll mention how Smite's balance has changed how the players use the tools that are available. I guess I'll mention items first. Back in beta, all gods were able to build any of the items, whether they be magical or physical. Stats worked differently for this to happen, obviously, with physical damage affecting basic attacks and magical boosting abilities. Was it complete madness? Yes. Was it fun as hell? Absolutely. Obvious example here would be the ever so popular Damage Ymir, with his ability to put a big nasty hole in just about anything with one whack. Other standouts would be Zeus dressing up as a hunter, and I don't want to talk about him yet. Actives were also still a thing back then. If you don't know, actives were like the relics Smite has now, or the summoner spells that League has, except you actually had to buy them with the in-game currency. Meaning there was actually a bit of strategy involved in deciding when to get one and when to upgrade it, since you would be sacrificing an item purchase to get an active instead. So is it really worth it? There was also just a whole lot of them, especially in beta, where all sorts of unique ideas were being tried out. Like Motivate, an active that turned your minions into additional players, because the power boost was just that high. Paired with another relic called Turn Minion, which did what you think it does, and also passively boosted minion resistances, yeah, now the game was basically playing itself for a while, at least until- ah, not right now. Speaking of game playing, the god pool was still small, but there was a clear trend, an overall lack of mobility. On release, only about half of the god selection had some sort of dash or leap, so you actually had to be careful about choosing when you were going to engage, since escaping was not as easy as entering. Crowd control also matched mobility's popularity in kits, meaning there wasn't much of it in the game at this point. Maybe a character had one hard CC locked behind their ultimate, or they would have softer CCs in like two abilities. It wasn't as easy to lock down opponents for free kills, but this increased the importance of recognising when to use these abilities to really change the course of a match. Overall, the word I would use to describe Smite during its beta phase would be tactical. You had a lot of different decisions to make which created an experience where you had to weigh the pros and cons of certain situations and strategies. This can be applied to any MOBA I suppose, but Smite took it that tiny bit further and it filled an enjoyable niche as a result. Not to mention all the amazing god additions during beta, Bakasura and Aphrodite being clear favourites of myself, but we also got Onher, Neef, Ares, Four, Loki... Okay, there's really no escaping this, is there? I can say as many good things about Smite's beta as I want, but this guy ultimately ruined the whole thing for a lot of people. Guan Yu had an area heal, a dash, a protection shredding damage move that lasted years, and an ultimate larger than a Smite Whale's skin collection. Seriously, this guy was a guardian? As in a team protector? Could have fooled me since he's diving towers and taking out the enemy like it's nothing. I don't think I can ever accurately express how unbelievably powerful old Guan Yu was. He had everything from damage to defense to sustain to mobility. Only thing that isn't here is a good hard CC, but considering mobility is a lacking trait for a lot of other gods right now, yeah, there was no escaping him. Was he the most broken god in Smite history? Maybe. He's certainly a good pick for the number one spot, but there are a few contenders that I'll talk about as they come, which certainly wanted to fight for that position. But yeah, apart from one guy trying to ruin the game as much as he could, it was still a good game. So good that people decided to give high res money. I'm trying to transition into monetization. You could buy skins, as to be expected, but the game did still look the way it did, so some of them looked a little... off at times, but at least high res are trying. Second option was much more appealing, the Ultimate God Pack. For £20 or 30 American dollars, you'll gain access to all current and future gods without having to buy them. Considering that there would be over 100 in a few years, it's definitely a good deal and probably the only good one hi have ever made. Also helps that buying the pack got you access to the closed beta. So yeah, it made some good dosh. That reminds me, how many players were there in beta? Oh my. If you didn't already know, a lot of people were interested in Smite. Why? Well, have I just not explained? hi -res at this point finally had a successful product. Now all they had to do is make sure that they're keeping their players happy so they can rake in that sweet, sweet dough. So let's talk about the things they took away. Woo!
Okay, so the conquest map was reduced in how wide it was to make it match other MOBAs more closely and reduce the confusion with how big it was. A good change, I suppose, but with every positive must come a negative since the physical and magical damage split was also introduced, meaning mages and guardians could only build magical items and hunters, assassins and warriors could only build physical ones. This resulted in abilities and basic attacks both increasing in power with a damage item. And yeah, it did suck to lose out on the choice that was presented before, but when every item is accessible for everyone, balance does become way more difficult. I can understand why they made the change, but the greater choice and variety that was presented before would have given players tons more ways to play the game. Hi-Rez also forced the jungler role upon the community with the introduction of Boomba's Mask, which I see as the most ratchet solution to a problem I have ever seen. You could have just made the jungle actually appealing without the item instead of forcing away the 2-1-2 meta. And what else? Near the end of the open beta, they changed the Minotaurs into Titans and removed the mechanic where they would fight each other in the centre of the map after too long, but considering most games never reached that point, it's not a big loss. Okay, yeah, I am being mean, but I do not approve of the removal or simplification of certain mechanics, especially since it was these differences that made Smite stand out in the first place. It wasn't all bad though, the game received graphical upgrades to not look like a college project, and the UI became far more stylized and visually appealing. There were the addition of more game modes like Duel, Joust and Domination, and the removal of game modes like Domination, and no I'm not going to talk about that one anymore, eat your heart out. I haven't even mentioned the VGS system they ripped straight from Tribes, but yeah it was a godlike decision. It's always been used in a toxic way, but in a serious match it's invaluable. The beta period finished off with a launch tournament, okay technically it was in season 1 but indulge me, acting as the first large scale event that really showed Smite's potential as an esport. Okay yeah the prize pool wasn't as high as others but it gave us some of the best plays this game has ever seen. From Shadow Q, a little bit premature. Kraken coming through. Zapman will fall. Shadow Q in a bit of trouble as well. Lass is pumping damage into Badger. Badger Force out of the fight. Chain Lightning doing work as well. Shadow Q juking Reels. Reels can't find the hit. Shadow Q still alive. Whirlpool gonna miss. Best set. It's down goes Reels. Shadow Q still with the juice. One play from Shadow Q. Got the twig. Three stacks. He's gonna fall here as well. Ultimate. Dead mate. Down falls. Got the twig. And Dinka Toss takes the fight. Amazing. Finally, the beta period came to an end on the 25th of March 2014. Two years in beta. Lots of changes, lots of ups and downs, but the player base was happy by the end of it. Everyone was looking forward to Smite's future. But could high res deliver? Yeah, they did. Okay, not really. Okay, sort of. As it comes. First things first, those redesigns. Okay, yeah, a lot of them happened in open beta, but I'm talking about it now. The game's whole art direction had taken a shift, focusing on being far more realistic in both its visual designs of the maps and the designs of the gods themselves, being outfitted in more appropriate attire and looking less cartoonish due to less saturation in their textures. Conquest looked like this, and Joust looked like this. Overall, some good changes. While I mention game modes, I might as well talk about the one they added this season, Siege. A four-person, two-lane mistake which was never corrected. Okay, I know I may have angered a lot of people with that statement, but in my eyes, Siege should be deleted, so those players can fill up the other game modes some more. Siege is structured very similarly to Conquest, having the aforementioned two lanes with a jungle in between them, and the same amount of towers and phoenixes with a titan at the end. So what's the problem? It's the Siege-specific minion called the Juggernaut. They are big, tanky, and ruin the entire mode. Each team has a counter that spawns a Juggernaut when when it reaches 100. You build points by killing minions, gods, jungle camps, and you've probably already seen the issue. It's Snowball. The winning team often gets to control more of the map due to a level and gold advantage. Now they also get a free tower buster as insurance, in case the defenders try to make a comeback. It doesn't help that in the center of the map there's a wild juggernaut, which will spawn another one when killed. I should also mention that what lane these guys spawn in is seemingly random, so yes, you can get two on the same side. As if high Res specifically made this mode just to anger me, they also added a teleporter in the team bases, so you can go right back to the juggernaut after recalling to buy items or recover health, resulting in overwhelming pressure for the defenders to deal with and oh for goodness sake I cannot understand why anyone would willingly play this. 
<sighs> Enough about Siege. How are the other game modes doing? Well, in Season 1, they decided to be very bold and told all magical gods to sit down. Guardians being made obsolete because of warriors could tank better and deal more damage, resulting in games easily dragging out past 50 minutes. Odin was a hunter's best friend at this point. Hard to imagine currently, I know. The warrior meta was in full effect and it did get out of hand. Apparently there were matches where up to three warriors were picked and games resulted in dragging on for an eternity. On the bright side, the player base finally got to experience the opposite end of the meta's previous. Instead of everyone dying to a slight gust of wind, now you would never take your hands off the keyboard because you would very rarely see the respawn counter. It did result in the entire class being nerfed, but don't worry, they'll be here again soon enough. Let me roll back to Hunters since they were dominating everywhere after the changes and ruined everything as Hunters tend to do. What was the meta now? Well, we were all horses for a while. Seriously, the builds were named after mythical steeds for some reason. Just variations of lifesteal builds with a focus in attack speed and damage and penetration. They had everything under the sun and it showed while playing the game because heaven forbid we last any longer than five seconds against a hunter with CC and mobility. I'm looking at you Apollo. But balance can be such a chore to discuss. Why don't we go over something everyone likes? Money. High res especially love money, it's a large reason as to why they do the things they do. One of these things includes the addition of... Chests. Everyone's absolute favourite form of monetization. Okay, what can I really say about these parasites? They are pretty much the worst thing in the history of anything ever. You are releasing a product that people want to buy, but instead they must buy raffle ticket after raffle ticket in hopes that they will get what they want. But do you want to know a secret? Well, it's an open secret, but still, wanna know? They don't get it. Not until the last roll. Two reasons. One, most chests are stuffed with so many filler items that you end up having to spend a small fortune to get what you want. We're talking loot boxes with 50 plus items inside them, with only about half of them being actual skins. Don't worry, Sunny Jim, hi res have made sure that you get plenty of ward skins and icons too while dumping £3.50 or 5 United States dollary dues per roll. I mean, are you kidding me? It costs so much to empty a single chest, especially when they're all filled with such garbage. Reason 2. They're rigged. Yeah, I know, shocking, right? hi res scamming their player base. Who would have guessed? Let me explain. Let's say we have a chest with six items in it. One of these is an exclusive skin that you actually want, and the other five are filler. Those five filler skins have a 19% chance to drop, but the skin we actually want will only have a 5% chance to drop. What's worse is that as you empty the chest and your wallet, that exclusive skin will remain at 5%, even if there is only one other item in the chest. How do we know this? Well, Hi-Rez apparently told us according to some Reddit comments. Although, I couldn't find a source for this, but if I accidentally told everyone that I was scamming them, then I would probably delete the message too. It's not like we actually needed confirmation of this anyways. If you've ever experienced a chest opening, then you already know what it's like. And that is a depressing, soul-crushing, ball-twistingly painful realisation to make, especially after burning so much cash. Worst part is, over the years, hi res have just gotten more and more greedy with their tactics. During season 4 and 5, pretty much every skin that was released was locked behind some sort of event or chest, and that should not be acceptable. They got slightly better in season 6, but it will never fully change, because for some reason, there are some really, really stupid people out there that will actually dump money for this trash. One more note about these piles of carcinogen would be in patch 3.8. They actually took all current chests at the time and made their drop chances equal. Yeah, seriously, right there in the patch notes. They are not ashamed in the slightest. It's all about the money. This year also founded the annual event known as the Odyssey, basically a big collection of exclusive skins that when purchased would reward you with more exclusive skins, and the prize at the end of the rainbow being a tier 5 skin, which changes the character model, animations, voice pack, and evolves over the course of a match, usually every 5 levels, but there are exceptions. How much does it cost? Well, the price fluctuates year to year between 8,000 and 9,000 gems, which is about 70 royal British pounds or $100.
hey, at least the skins are nice. Honestly, I think they might have made more money in the long term by making the skins always available, pricing a tier 5 around £20 like League of Legends does, but I want that for every skin in this game. But it's clear that the chests and limited time events make more money in the short term, and it's clear that high res worry more about the immediate future rather than the actual future. They act like they're always on the verge of bankruptcy or something. <sighs> okay, what other stuff did they add? Well, we got limited skins because the incentive incentive to buy something could never be there without a doomsday clock. We got loading borders, pedestals, the things you stand on in the god select, icons, ward skins, yeah thanks for that one by the way, we really need them to fill chests, and announcer packs. Fair enough. Okay, so what's left? Oh yeah, the SPL, the Smite Pro League. It was officially founded in Season 1 and it had a huge prize pool. Just look at that number. Yeah, but honestly, good stuff. The large amount of money most definitely would attract more organisations for the future. It makes sense for Smite to have a Pro League like this. Not really much else to say. Okay, I know I might have made Season 1 sound like a disappointment, but apart from high res not having the firmest grasp on balance yet, or their attempts at scamming the player base, it really wasn't. It introduced a lot of traditions which would become events for the community to look forward to, and they still seem to be having fun throughout the whole thing despite being taken for a ride. Bottom line, everyone was happy, but mildly concerned. Ah, uh, Season 2. For many people, this would be their favourite year in Smite's history, not just because it was the first for many players due to the game's rising popularity and its addition to Steam, but also because of the content added. Seriously, Season 2 had the best god releases hands down. Hoyi, Bologna, Sol, Radatoska, Ravana, that one took a while, Arpoash, Kepri, oh sweet lord the love bug. These characters, both visually and mechanically, are incredible. Drybear's genius is nearly unparalleled, his only disadvantage being that he can't decide if this much damage is too much damage. Like Soul releasing with item combos like Polynomicon, that damn near one-shot squishies, Kepri's revive cooldown feeling like it was below 10 seconds, Rat living up to his name, dashing through the entire map and shredding everyone's protections, Bologna being able to casually 1v5, yeah I'm glad everyone remembers that infamous SBL match. Seriously man, get a grip and stop breaking our backs. Season 2 also came with a new conquest map and some more redesigns, featuring a much cooler colour palette and the addition of the ever so beloved purple buff, giving you an attack speed increase, perfect for those dirty AA hunters. Speaking of dirty, a new way to earn money was added, the season ticket. What is it? Well, it functions almost exactly the same as the battle passes you see today, rewarding you with points that you get from playing the game to earn stuff like skins. So high res actually innovated a little here. I'm still sure they stole the idea from somewhere though. What made the season ticket far more interesting than others would be an alternative way of earning points. As the SPL went on throughout the year, those who bought in could vote on which team they thought would win each match in every split going on to earn points if they predicted correctly. This wasn't a small amount of points either. You got way more this way than just playing the game. What an incredible way to get people to check out your pro scene. Seriously, this was a stroke of genius on hi Res's part. It even worked on me for a time. Ah, oh, those were the days. Now with all that nostalgia pandering out the way, let's talk about why Season 2 was actually rubbish. Yeah, people can claim that this year was Smite's best all they want, but the people actually playing the game at this time will tell you a very different story. I won't beat around the bush here. The balance was god-awful and I can see why Drybear's design team was replaced in Season 3. The perfect word to describe this situation would be Voltaire. There were quite a number of different strategies going on throughout the year. You could be playing the game and everyone was using Hand of the Gods while running around and securing every jungle creep imaginable, then go into hibernation for a month to come back seeing free hunter comps. What on earth is going on? I'll tell you what's going on. Heartseeker is currently more criminal than knife crime and twice as painful. Why? Because it gave power, a decent passive, movement speed, and was cheaper than your mother's Saturday night special. Like, did you just expect this not to replace boots? Ooh, replacements! Heartseeker was eventually nerfed into a 
Agency, where it stayed for like two years, and was replaced by the new kid on the block, Bluestone Pendant, a starter item which gave power, mana, and a passive which dealt damage over time after hitting an enemy with an ability. Didn't hurt hunters in the slightest though, they just migrated to the mid lane for a time. The item was also really good on warriors too, and would stay as a staple pick for the solo lane, but it was still busted for a time, Sung Wukong being especially powerful with it. Speaking of the Monkey King, wow was he a lame bully. Does anyone here actually remember him poking every other solo to death? hi -Rez did deal with this problem, but in the most confusing way possible. Rather than nerfing Bluestone, they increased Wukong's ability costs and sliced his damage, leaving him as the impoverished mana whore monkey he still is today. Yeah, maybe he did need some tweaking, but Bluestone's passive was still nuts and every other warrior and ability based hunter that was being picked ran the thing, so it's like the developers were just blind to what was going on. After that whole debacle, healers were insta-banned in ranks for a little bit because of the nerfs to weakening curse and anti-heal active. Hell's heal was still instantaneous at this time, so yeah, very not good. This one was resolved quickly though, and was followed by the last large-scale meta in Season 2, bearing a name that if uttered along with implications of its return would be considered heretical. What I speak of is... The Dirty Bubble. Named after the sinner who found it, a Dirty Bubble build consisted of a mix of damage and defensive items on gods who primarily focused on damage, mages, hunters and assassins to be specific. They were basically bruiser builds, but thanks to the amount of tankiness that defensive items gave you around this time, a little bit of this after buying Bluestone Pendant and some penetration, and boom, you're an unkillable killer. Sounds OP, right? Well, there was actually a fairly effective counter strategy to this. It was called, I'll have what he's having, so now everyone is unkillable and games went on well past an hour. That doesn't even mention how our poor warriors were left out of all the fun, since they just didn't have the damage to compete. Guardians could be picked, but why would you want to, when an assassin supporter like Najar or Fenrir can do the same? Our Poash could sit in the solo lane and gobble up corpses all day for maximum sustain, Thanatos could dive into five man teams and walk away, Nox was actually overpowered, it was a complete mess but was absolutely hilarious to see the game flipped on its head. The whole situation was so chaotic that it resulted in huge changes being made in Season 3 to ensure defensive items would never be useful ever again. Yeah, Dirty Bubble was different and probably caused the growth of some sort of tumour, but it was a change from the burst metas up until now. Instead of spending half the game looking at a death screen, you were actually playing the whole time. It's just that the map wasn't big enough to support that sort of proposal. Okay, that's all of them. Really goes to show that hi -Rez just can't get a grasp on how balance is even spelt. I won't go over each season like this, but it is important to acknowledge that they never have or will have any clue about their game. So what else happened? Well, we got the second Odyssey, which came with the best T5 skin. Suck it, Archon, you're far too busy of a design. Oh yeah, Smite was also released in beta on the Xbox One, and the two platforms aren't balanced separately. You can tell there's going to be a lot of talk about that later. Oh, and the SPL. Big teams are getting involved now, big teams. We got Enemy, Fnatic, Diginus, Denial, Titan, Epsilon, Cloud9. Hey, those last two were actually against each other in the semi-finals. Man, I hope we got some good- Me. I could never truly fathom why Cloud9 passed on top picks like Bologna, but I'm sure repeatedly throwing Neef mid against the enemy wasn't the best idea since they would eventually adapt to the slightly obvious pick. Was I mad? Absolutely. I voted for Cloud9 on the season ticket. Did this set kill any and all interest in the SBL for me? Yep. Which is why I'll only mention big changes and controversies from here. And that's about it for season 2. I think. Man, what a journey. As for new players, I can understand why they think it's the best. When you're new, you don't quite understand the game as well, and you're just looking for a bit of fun. So all the broken god releases and new meta every five minutes just added more laughs for the people who weren't already experienced. But come on guys, let's not kid ourselves. This season could have been handled way better. The player base was optimistic, always optimistic, but concerned.
Things are starting to get interesting now. Season 3, the year that Smite was finally born for some people, and the year it truly died for many more. Are both valid? No, only one is, stop lying to yourself. We kicked off with a brand spanking new cinematic trailer, one that would be used repeatedly because it was probably too expensive to make, but as an agent of advertising it certainly did its job. Season 3 saw a large influx of new players. <laughs> You're gonna wish you didn't. Before I list what changed here, it's important to note that the design team had changed from Season 2 to 3, with Hi-Rez Ajax now holding the reins for the gameplay decisions. Does that mean that his team are responsible for all the bad decisions? No, not really. I prefer to see hi constant destruction of their property as a collective effort. But what changes happened? Well, first of all, we got a new conquest map that was more open than the previous options, with fewer walls and more gaps. The removal of the purple buff for some reason, this was probably done to nerf hunters. Oh yeah, and the complete annihilation of the speed buff. Get a load of this. The speed buff was removed and mana was put in its place. Speed and Al was split into three minions where the fire giant is, who each had a mini buff that stacked. What did this result in? Why well, it couldn't possibly have been junglers now fighting right at the beginning of the game, probably roping their solo buddies into it as well, and the whole thing leading to one jungler completely snowballing over the other. Oh wait, that is what happened, and everyone hated it. They hated it in the test server, and they still hated it when hi -Rez decided to ignore the community's feedback back and put it in the game anyways. Yeah, the change was eventually reverted after a few patches, but I can't imagine how anyone thought it was a good idea in the first place. In fact, I think that the whole jungle role was cursed this season considering the golden XP that you got from camps was the equivalent of the 1940 London rations, resulting in a lot of leeching off of other lane minions. Jungling felt more like a leading role in Oliver Twist than a contributing member of the team. Okay, so Conquest has been ruined but at least I can still play Joust. Actually, Season 3 introduced a new map for the game mode. Are you excited? I'm not. Let's go over the old Joust map first, since the game mode is surprisingly popular. It's a three lane map with the centre acting as the battleground with the other two being thinner and holding buffs. It was simple in its design really, but was still open to more complex strategies being applied thanks to how the map was symmetrical. Both teams could clear blue, then red, then contest in lane for the safest option. Or one team could risk it for a biscuit and invade the enemy for some extra goodies. The enemy could predict this and set up an ambush or invade themselves which, yes, is just the two teams swapping places, but it didn't feel like that. There are a lot of different ways you could trick the enemy into thinking you were somewhere else, especially after the tower fell and a route directly to the Phoenix was open. Oh god, the Phoenix. Okay, yes, there was a large problem with turtling with the old Joust map. After losing the early, teams would sit and farm under the Phoenix since the area was so small. It was very easy to pester anyone trying to get in and deal some extra damage. It didn't help that the Titan in this map was also hard to kill as well. Was this strategy impossible to beat? No. A good tank and some actives that will help push away their impending doom certainly made a statement, but expecting randoms to be so coordinated is an unrealistic expectation. Another problem would be the size of the centre lane itself. It's as wide as a conquest lane I guess, but large area of effect abilities, like Zeus's or Arpoash's ultimate, cover the entire thing, and since the escape routes are so limited, you can see why people hide under Phoenix. Was Old Joust good? Yeah, I suppose. Pose. I'm sure everyone will universally agree that it could have been better. So maybe a new map is in order then. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? Everything, apparently. Season 3 Joust is a curse to this existence, and I believe it is to blame for every tragedy since its debut. Okay, it's not that bad, but I really do not like it. Alright, so they took the additional route that previously connected to Phoenix, and made it so it actually connects to this side of the thing. That makes turtling more difficult and opens up ganking opportunities. Good change. They removed the wall in between the Titan and the Phoenix. I'm indifferent about this. They completely changed the left and right lanes, one side having a single single red buff and the other having two mana buffs. Why would you do this? You do realise that this means in every game, both teams will be fighting over the same buff, red, in order to get a gold, XP and damage lead to get to level 5 first and ult dump the enemy team, hopefully killing them and creating a snowball effect. No one starts at blue, if you do that you're throwing. Why did you take away my options? So now the enemy is two levels ahead and treating us the way your mother was treated after daddy's PS4 was taken away. Now they can safely 
to go get the bull demon. What's the bull demon? It's Joust's equivalent of the fire giant that gives a health and mana regeneration buff, so the enemy doesn't have to back and can harass the losers even more. Oh, but it gets better. Killing the bull demon also disables the enemy's tower or phoenix for 90 seconds, as if they haven't already suffered enough. So now the winning team will steamroll for just a little bit longer and win just before tea time. The problems with the old Joust map were not addressed. They were simply reversed. Instead of a turtle problem, we now have a snowball problem, and one team is always feeling more depressed than the other. Maybe it makes more sense this way though. Heaven forbid a match go over 15 minutes after all, Smite is a casual game now. And on top of all that, they decided to keep the exact same size for the center lane, so huge ability are still more oppressive than Asian educational systems. Yeah, there are more escape routes now, but that doesn't fix the core problem. Just make the center lane wider. Okay, so now with the two game modes I actually liked being ruined, there's no reason to play this game anymore. Lovely! At least Arena is alright. Or is it? Nah, Arena is fine. Actives ain't though. I suppose one feature starting with A had to go. They were replaced by the relic system. Instead of being able to buy two relics and upgrade them whenever you want, you now get to choose one free relic at the start of a match, then choose another at level 12, but they still cost gold to level up. So what Hi-Rez decided to do was remove a strategic decision that could be made on whether to continue building an item or make an investment into an active which has a powerful effect yet a long cooldown. Why did you take away my options? What this resulted in was a large influx of survivability coming from everyone using Aegis and Beads all the time. Even to this day, I can see why. I mean, complete immunity for two seconds sounds pretty good, as does being freed from crowd control. Still, having the same two options repeated for most of the gods in this game is really boring, and yeah, it's still the same today. Guess it doesn't help that so many gods have CC abilities from him that this stuff actually does feel required, otherwise you're gonna lose. Speaking of gods, what was the roster like this year? Pretty okay, I guess. I mean, we got Amaterasu and Fafnir, but we also got Rajin, a bipolar god that is constantly switching between top tier and throw pick. Skadi, who temporarily terrorized everyone with her pet heat-seeking missile. Susano, who did the same thing, but with damage you'd swear was nuclear. Erlang Shen. Okay, Erlang is an interesting case, because in his patch, 3.12, was really the first where everyone noticed something... wrong. Like, the patch was unfinished. Why? Well, take a good long look at Erlong Dong. Notice anything strange here? Let me bring up some other gods for comparisons. If you guessed that he was the Chinese god of Play-Doh, You'd be wrong, but that was certainly what everyone was thinking at the time. Yeah, this was fixed two patches later. Nice response time, by the way. The fact that he was released looking like this at all is absolutely disgraceful. Something had to be sacrificed to seal the demon away, I suppose. Oh wait, you don't know? Ooh, I can tell a story. Gather round, children, gather round. For I will now share the tale of the wicked, the hated, the despised, the revolted. Golden Bow. Starting out as an item only Mercury would buy thanks to its power, critical chance, and movement speed, in patch 3.5 it got a new passive. What was the old passive? Who cares? The new passive gave all basic attacks a cleave effect, dealing 50% damage to gods and 75% damage to minions in a small area around the basic attack. Seems like a good item, right? Especially for gods who don't have abilities good enough to clear waves. There was one tiny problem with the item though. It also worked on hunters. Turns out, being able to clear the wave whilst being far away from it is actually really powerful. Who would have thought? Suddenly, every hunter was viable in every role. It didn't matter what you were up against since you could just clear the wave quicker than them anyways. Maybe a mage could dump abilities faster, but that costs mana. Golden Bow uses nothing. It got so mad to the point where hunters were being run in the solo lane, a lane designated for tanks and farming. Hashtag Artemis Solo Gang if any of you remember. What did hi do in response to this? Well, two patches later in 3.7, they took away the crit chance. Okay, good. But they also made it deal more damage and gave it more movement speed. Why? Golden Bow wasn't the entire reason why 2016 was the year of the Hunters, although none of the following shifted the meta as heavily. Soul Eater was pretty crazy, providing a passive which gave you back a percentage of your health on a basic, on top of a 30% attack speed buff, 
As soon as someone bought this, they weren't leaving lane. Quinsize is another accomplice, giving a passive which dealt percentage health damage to the enemy, while its brother, Executioner, shredded their protections. Both of these gave even more damage and attack speed, by the way. All of these were built on every hunter. No exceptions. We dealt with this borderline terrorism for five months. That's a long time to be repeatedly smashing your head against a marble table. The solution was so simple too. Just deal with the biggest problem first and make Golden Bow a melee only item. hi -Rez had already introduced similar items in the Season 3 launch, so we all knew it was possible. This method would also keep auto attack focused characters like Kali, Bakasura and Mercury as viable picks who didn't abuse the item's power as bad. Did hi -Rez do that? Of course they didn't! Instead, they removed Golden Bow from the game completely. Fantastic. Ugh. This would actually be a common trend of the new design team, removing problem areas completely by deleting them from the game or nerfing them into irrelevancy. Don't believe me? The aforementioned Golden Bow, the young power pot star, killed by level gating the thing, the wisdom tab being taken away since it was being used to tell if a team killed the Gold Fury, rituals being introduced and deleted faster than most backup copies of Photoshop files, and Sunder not being allowed to be viable, but I'll get to those two later. What else is there to complain about? <laughs> wow, this list is really long. Here we go, server issues. Okay, so let's all agree that they were never good in the first place, but since there were fewer players in the good old days, they weren't as noticeable. We're talking crashes, disconnects, latency issues, the whole package. Why does this happen? No idea, I don't do networking. But it's probably due to Smite's server size being in the triple digits. The server problems never got better, and you should never expect them to. Same with the matchmaking system. Oh yeah, matchmaking. Hi-Res decided to implement a system called True skill, a matchmaking format which tries to balance all its players around a 50% win rate. Sounds good on paper, but in game it translates to higher ranked players, so high diamonds or masters, being paired with platinums or low diamonds because they were winning too much. I guess the thought process was, well, if they're winning so much, they should be able to win with worse teammates. But this is a competitive game, so losing a match because your team simply wasn't on your level or the enemy's level is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Hi-Rez did update the core code to the matchmaking system in Season 4, but honestly, I think the changes made were minuscule at best, or a flat-out lie at worst. All these years later, and it's still as bad as ever, probably worse. Just take a look at these. Can I even show this on YouTube? Seriously, what's going on? Well, what's going on is that divided player base I mentioned earlier, except now it's way worse, since we have a Conquest, Joust, Arena, Clash, Siege, and three ranked game modes. The player base is split between nine modes, no wonder finding a fair match is difficult. That's not even including the different game regions. So, yeah, the game is falling apart, but hey, at least you can still spend money. hi -Rez even gave us more ways to do so, as Season 3 really started off their abuse of chests and events. Later years would almost see the complete removal of directly purchasable skins since they're all locked behind some sort of paywall exclusivity now. Maybe you would earn more money if people could actually buy what they want, but I know whales are the only reason why this disaster is still afloat, but they will move on eventually, and changing things now will only cause an uproar amongst them. You've dug your own grave. And on top of all that, they changed Nox's taunt. Why would you do this? How am I supposed to choke my chicken now? I mean, I guess I can use the many, many suggestive skins in this game. I'm glad to see hi -Riz enjoy the female form as well. Okay, so what was good about Season 3? Well, the Odyssey gave us the best T5 skin. Yeah, I prefer Ragnarok 4X, but Demonic Pack Anubis is just so cool. HUD themes are now a thing, so the game's art direction can be smacked on the head even further. The season ticket was, um, nice. That's about it. Was Season 3 good? No. Was it the worst Smite has gone through? Also no but it was certainly trying to get there. Just so many baffling decisions made throughout the whole year, and that did honestly worry the community, especially since Paladins was also released that year, and Hi-Rez's track record still looks like this. Yeah, everyone was very concerned. This party is no longer crazy, let's leave. Season 4, or as I like to call it, Season 3 Part 2 Electric Boogaloo, is commonly agreed to be Smite's worst year. Why? Well, ain't that why you're here?
to hear me explain? I think a better question is, do I agree? Well, all seasons post the third are equally as terrible in my eyes. I personally dislike the fifth the most, but hey, we'll get there. Season 4 started off the year with patch notes filled with all sorts of stuff. Why don't we go over some? First of all, we got skins, the true reason people play Smite. But I'll focus on this one specifically. Why did you create this vessel of pure evil? Don't ask me why I own it either, I swear it was just for a video. There were two additions to Conquest, a camp next to the fire giant called the Portal Demon, which creates a portal from your base to the camp when you kill it. Why was it added? To end games sooner. The second was a camp next to the Gold Fury, called the Oracle Harpies, which wards the area for the team who kills it. Why was it added? No idea, probably just another objective for that trademarked strategic thinking. The T screen from the good old Season 2 days was also brought back. Looks a little different now, but it serves the same functionality, minus being able to see the gold counts of both teams, since high res don't want players to easily understand that an objective was taken. Speaking of taking things, the season ticket was taken back to the high res farm for improvements, and came out in pieces. Now there are three season tickets to match the three splits that the SPL was having that year, one from spring, summer, and autumn. I did miss the progression you felt over an entire year with the previous system, and the fact that that you could level up without having to play the game religiously, but people who are already spending money on Smite are probably doing that already, so I guess it's not the biggest issue. What is an issue would be the reset of everyone's ranked MMR, standing for matchmaking rating. It's basically a system in place that rates how good a player is despite their actual placement, there to make sure that when placements are reset, players who were previously placed in Diamond wouldn't be matched up with people in Bronze, despite both being unranked. Their rating is still the same. So why did high do this? Well, there was no explanation in the patch notes, so I'd like to imagine it was done just to annoy us. But what did it result in? Well, as you can most likely assume, Ranked was unplayable for about two months until everyone's MMR evened out, and pros weren't being matched up with people who were playing the game for the first time anymore. God leaderboards were also introduced, a system where players are given a placement similar to the Ranked game modes, but only to a single god. How does it work? I have no idea and I don't think anyone else does either. Supposedly you get a higher placement if you're winning more matches, but judging by the images on screen, something has gone horribly wrong. Was it ever fixed? Don't know, don't care. It's a pointless system at best, and at worst it encourages picking the same character in ranked, rather than making a decision based on the matchup and team composition. Remember, this is still the patch notes at the beginning of the season. We haven't even moved forwards in time yet. The addition of the goddess, the Morrigan, Queen of Bugs, also arrived one patch before this, but I've always considered her a season 4 release, since it gives me more to talk about here. How broken was she? Well, I don't think she has ever been in a state that we can call stable enough for competitive. This is due to one ability, Changeling, her ultimate, which lets her choose from anyone on her team or the enemies to temporarily transform into. Level, abilities and items are all included. Sounds useful, right? Well, it is. It's actually game changing, but it's also game breaking. <laughs> there are too many bugs to mention, so I'll just include my favourites. Transforming into a teammate having a chance to add an extra player to the leaderboard. Transforming into an enemy doing the same thing. Morrigan's items disappearing when transforming back into herself. Winning a match while transformed will not trigger the victory screen, causing a soft lock. The transformation wheel just being unresponsive, requiring multiple clicks to confirm a choice. I think this one's caused by more than one instance of the menu appearing. Surrendering while transformed apparently caused the game to crash, and my favourite, transforming into someone and not being able to use any abilities. Things got so bad that she was even banned from that year's world championship due to a non-reproducible bug. At the end of the day, I guess I have to congratulate Hi-Rez for trying something so different, and eventually getting it into a not perfect but good enough state. But the point of talking about the Morrigan here was to bring up how one mechanic that flips the game on its head can really show how poorly made the game is. Too much spaghetti code from the early days and scripts probably ripped straight from Global Agenda are the likely causes, that and Unreal 3 just being outdated. Why don't I move on now? How about from one god to another? Hercules was buffed in Season 4. Yes, I know he was also buffed in Season 3, but I'd like to forget those painful memories. To his third ability specifically. Basically, he gets back a percentage of the damage he took as health while the ability is active. The problem? He also gets protections while it's active, so he became too hard to kill in the early, especially for burst characters. Actually, while Kevin Sorbo was dominating everyone, items that healed you in general were buffed as well, resulting in... Truly the greatest meta. Hell was nerfed as well, which 
absolutely baffles me. We could have had a true healing meta, but you decided that gods dedicated to the practice should be left out. Shameful. Okay, one more thing from the patch notes, I promise. Rituals. These were consumable items that would give the player a relic-like effect when used. There were four in total. Flickering, which was basically combat blink. Frenzy, which buffed the power and attack speed of nearby allies. Rallying, which teleported you to another friendly god. And Revealing, which revealed all enemies and enemy wards on the map for five seconds. You had to pay up to 750 gold for one, apart from Flickering, which was 1000. And you could only buy them past level 10. Seems fine right? Kind of reminds me of actives and the old days. Well, when everyone woke up and smelled the burning roses, they realised these things could affect anyone's match extremely heavily. Gold in the late game is already close to being a non-issue if you're being conservative, so teams absolutely had dosh to spare for at least one of these things, meaning these ultra-powerful buffs became omnipresent. Rallying caused backdooring to rise, with entire teams teleporting to a Loki who snuck in, Frenzy boosted damage way too much and made busting towers and titans too easy, Flickering gave gave you a get out of jail free card, and depending on your god choice, then it near guarantees escape. The only one that could be considered mediocre would be revealing, but that's just because its use cases are far more strategic in nature, and we all know what the smite player base is like. Add on to the fact that you could also buy multiple rituals and stack them, yeah, it didn't really matter how many times Hyras would tweak them, they were always going to be good, and yeah, they did try and nerf them. None of it worked though, so in patch 4.5, after much community feedback and backlash, they were removed from the game. At least they admitted defeat here. Okay, I'm nearly done, I promise. In all the relics featured in the patch notes, there were two which stood out from the rest. No, not Beads and Aegis. The first of these two being Sunder, a relic which fired a projectile that made the enemy receive 15% more damage, and when upgraded, it increased that to 30%. As you can imagine, this was completely bonkers, and every god started dealing true damage. The only true counter was to just really try and avoid it, since it is a projectile after all. But since CC is so prevalent in so many god kits, guaranteeing it also wasn't very hard. Okay, so we have this relic. It's breaking the game over its knee. How should high res respond? Well, by removing only 5% from the 30 total. Outstanding response. Look, I know you guys didn't want to kill the item. But this was a bad idea from the start. This sort of debuff is too powerful when tied with the fact that this is a team game and the sheer amount of ways that you can near guarantee it. This whole shindig went on for months, got to a point where pros were taking breaks from Smite, leading to hi -res finally responding one day later with a nerf to its unupgraded and upgraded forms, down to 10% and 15% respectively. Did this change make it worthless? Well, it was alright in Duel, but the gold needed to upgrade isn't worth a 5% increase. Eventually they came to their senses and just made it deal true damage with a small debuff when upgraded. That's a nice niche pick, but unfortunately relics focused on survivability are used usually more prioritised. Good thing I mentioned survivability, because that will let me segue into the second relic, Bracer of Undoing, which when used will take away 3 seconds from all cooldowns and give you 50% of all the damage taken within the last 3 seconds as health. When upgraded, the time span is increased to 5. While Sunder was getting looks from all the preps, Bracer was overlooked and picked up by tramps like me and abused for maximum survivability. Seriously, this thing tied with an Aegis made you seem almost unkillable. Most people at first didn't know how to respond, which created a lot of whining after Sunder was nerfed because casual players aren't known for their knowledge of the game. Unfortunately, hi -res caved in and made the cooldown reduction an upgrade only effect and reduced its heal from 50% to 40. Okay, so I get why some people had an issue with the cooldown. Despite most abilities requiring so much downtime, that using Bracer to make abilities kinda combo with themselves is very niche, if not possible at all. Apart from that, are we really gonna act like Bracer was good at all? I know some people may be furious at me right now because of that sentence, but there was actually a really good way to make the enemy's Bracer completely useless. It's called counterbuilding, have you heard of it? This reason alone is why I actually liked Bracer when everyone considered it powerful, since it's one of the very few relics that can actually be countered by your item choices, unlike Aegis or Beads, which are powerful, boring, require little skill to utilise effectively, and can't be accounted for in any way. 
play. And yes, those two were also buffed in the season patch notes. I think to really top off the idea that the balance team had no clue what they were doing would be the small addition in patch 4.13, where they added a global sound cue to trigger when a large camp like the Fire Giant or Gold Fury was slain, despite the reason for the T-screen's removal in Season 3 being the fact that players were using it to tell if these camps were taken due to gold increases. Really goes to show how the game's design has changed, how simple it's all become. I can prove it too. Season 4 introduced the two year long mistake known as Adventures, a temporary game mode which acts more like a mini game. Remember to buy the bundles that come with each new adventure, spend your money, just ignore the tumors. I'll go over all 10 of them now, because 1. I hate them and I don't want to talk about them, and 2. This way is arguably simpler. First matchup, I do it! Nike's Valley of Victory. It's captured a flag, but with only five gods. Trash. Next matchup. I do it. I do it. Apollo's Racer Rumble. Smite's a kart racing game now. It's okay, but the drifting is too good that you'll do it on straights. Gives me crash racing flashbacks. Our third Our matchup. I do it. I do it. Trials of King Hercules is a PvE map with levels and bosses and stuff. It would be the best PvE adventure thanks to its tight team coordination which is actually pretty challenging and fun, but unfortunately to make an item build you need to find items which you get randomly from killing bosses, so if you actually want to beat the mode then you have to do an ungodly amount of grinding first. Fourth matchup. Corrupted Arena. It's Arena, but with holes. Very innovative. Fifth matchup. Shadows of Hercropolis. It's the Hercules one again, but different. It still has the same issues, and the enemy design is a little cheaper. Sixth matchup. Legend of the Foxes. You defend a bunch of towers in a PvE map, and then kill a boss. Items are bought during the game, but most of the enemies are just damaged sponges with no depth or complex attacks. Seventh matchup. Inner Demon Arena. It's Arena, but with insta kill puddles. Really going against the grain. Next matchup. Medusa's Deathmatch. It's a 3v3v3 match set in a circular arena littered with bushes, walls, potions, and a buff in the middle. Items can be bought in between rounds, first to three wins. It is unironically the best game mode Smite has ever had. Kinda reminds me of how Battlerite focused on the action elements of a MOBA over the strategy of a larger map. Smite really should have done the same, and maybe it would have been a good game. Next matchup, I do it, I do it. Classic Joust. It's classic joust. Final matchup! Celestial Domination. It's domination. Well, that was easy. But how's the game doing now? Well, why don't we take a look at what gods are good right now and see, uh... Oh. Patch 4.21, otherwise known as Judgment Day, came with a number of buffs to Ula, specifically ones that decreased his mana costs, upped his scaling, and shortened the delay on his axe throw. Okay, so the scaling buffs didn't make too big of a difference, since Ula starts off as an ability-based hunter in the early game and migrates over to an auto-attack hunter in the late. However, the mana reductions helped his early immensely, since now he could spam his damage day and night while still starting games with two health and multi-potions. So yeah, the duo lane was ruined, and Ula was ruining everyone's games. It's just a shame that Ula mains couldn't enjoy him thanks to the one additional change, making his axe throw come out faster, from 0.4 seconds to 0.2, before Ula players had to predict slightly where the enemy would be when their axe came out. But now, since it was instant, they had to unlearn that habit, or risk being insta-deleted by the enemy who was also playing with their new player-friendly Ula. Did hi -res change? him at all when overwhelming amounts of player feedback was rolling in? Of course they didn't. In fact, he remained the exact same way for almost a year, where they only changed his scalings back. This means Ula was still like this while the SPL was running, and you can imagine how that went. So why did Tyrez do this? Well, because of Ula's T5 skin coming that year, of course, because if a god is powerful, then people will surely buy an overpriced skin for him. Actually, shady business practices could be a trend this year, considering the over nature hires have with chests and events at this point, it's only getting worse and worse. Just like the game at this point, everyone accepted that Smite was going into a pit of despair that it would never return from. We all just wanted to pretend things were better than they actually really were. A lot of people didn't though. Season 4 had a lot of players just up and leave, and for good reason. The way Hyrus was treating the game was unacceptable, and everyone was just pained to see it this way. Concerned? We were well past that. That feeling. It was more like grief.
Wow, lads, this corpse is still warm. Are you still hanging in there? Well, I hope so, because this year sucked. Starting off, we have a new conquest map, and I do not care, not in the slightest. It looks nice visually, and re-adding the Fog of War was a nice touch, but apart from being wider, it's barely different than the previous one. The start of this season also brought the burning at the stake of starter items, but from the ashes rose their true final forms, that being starter items designed for an entire class rather than for gods. The fact that these things are even called Hunter's Blessing and such tells me all I need to know. They're dumbed down to be easier to balance and for new players to understand. Even the new effects are boring. Apart from Warrior's Blessing, they all just give you more damage. So after build variety was waffle stomped even further down the drain, you'd think that we would at least be able to enjoy a good match. But you'd be wrong, very wrong, so incredibly wrong, because season 5 was the most technically broken season so far. Seriously, we had stuff like two jungle practice appearing in the menu for half a year, being unable to lock into gods, parties not working at all, if the party leader started a queue and no one else saw it, they would all have to restart to fix the issue, sound and music problems out the wazoo, matchmaking still sucks so bad that I want to trip down a sewer slide, and my favourite, our plush's ultimate dealing damage to towers. Very humorous. This is only a short list of the many issues, because there are simply too many to talk about. So Hi-Rez made sure that you can't play the game. Might as well ensure no one can watch it either. Enter Mixer, Microsoft's streaming platform. Decently known now, but back in 2018, no one had the foggiest clue to what it was. So it must have been a fantastic idea for Hi-Rez to make a deal with Mixer to exclusively stream SPL matches on the platform for the following two years. I definitely cannot see anything wrong with moving your entire competitive structure from two very popular streaming services to an up-and-coming one. Now I can rag on Mixer if I really want to, but this video isn't about that. Why did Hi-Rez take the deal? Money. I'm not sure how much money honestly, but it must have been a lot because they gave each player in the SPL actual salaries. If they lived in America, completely shafting European players. But hey, we also got more production value, and that sure was showcased in the first Mixer stream. <laughs> My god, what a mess that was. There was basically a whole lot of issues related to video compression going on. The video in the background should give you an idea of how it looked in motion. I do still look at these from time to time. Failure on a scale this large makes me quite happy. What doesn't make me happy though would be the decline of SBL viewership because of the platform change. Combine the move with sinking popularity, and of course there was going to be a drop. How could you not see this coming? A part of me thinks that Hi-Rez just saw the green. They just took the money for an immediate payday and pumped it into the company while trying to make Smite and Paladin's pro scenes look better, probably to get sponsors or something. At the end of the day, the people who want to watch pro matches will click on whatever link hi gives them, but do you know a solution that would actually draw in new viewers? Let people watch streams in the game client, or at least advertise with a link on the main menu. Then again, any more changes to the UI could possibly break it since it's barely working now anyways. Can't get much worse than this I suppose. Another feature that was was graciously gifted to us by streaming was the ability to earn in-game rewards by watching Twitch streams, as long as you had your Hi-Rez account linked. That was moved to Mixer after the steal, although they did sweeten it a little with some codes during the early Mixer days, until they stopped doing that because people were only watching streams for the codes and would later put them on Reddit. It was easy season ticket points while it lasted. Season 5 also provided us with a new patch show format. The patch show is just where Hi-Rez show off events, balance, skins, etc. Well, at least that's how it was until Season 5. Now renamed the Patch Showcase, showed all the new skins in great detail, while briefly going over the balance changes at the end. No one liked this new format. The reason we watched the show was to see how you're going to ruin the game's balance further, but by locking it behind a 30 minute wait time with only exclusive money sinks to occupy ourselves with is too much. Although with skins of this quality, I think they really are torturing us. Yeah, it's obviously done to try and get people to buy them, but I'm sure hi aren't that desperate for money. I am disgusted and appalled. Patch 5.8, taking up the sixth spot on the worst moments of human history list, only just beaten by 
World War One. This is the patch where I officially gave up on this game. First of all, you have to understand that this patch was the first of a new patch cycle. Instead of an update every two weeks, there would be one every three. The developers said this was specifically to polish the patch during its testing phase. With this news, the community rejoiced. Finally, the game would be less messy and rushed. Fast forward to the actual patch release and the game did not work. In my eyes, this was the buggiest smites ever been, but like I said earlier, I stopped caring, so maybe there's one even worse. Chernobog, the new god released with this patch, was unplayable, as in he was locked, and you couldn't pick him. How? If you tried to queue into a conquest map, the game would crash. The same for Clash. Queuing into Arena at least put you in a lobby. With two extra players, resulting in everyone getting kicked and called a deserter. If by some miracle of god you managed to get into a match, you couldn't buy any items half the time. If you were in a clan, you couldn't interact or even see it. It's as if the feature was finally removed after years of neglect. Season ticket points that players had earned had mysteriously vanished, and her Hercules' abilities dealing true damage for some reason, as if he needed more power. Stupid stuff was even happening while you were playing. Ho Yi's ricochets were bouncing infinitely. This and so much more was wrong with the game. Just think, this patch was delayed by an additional week. Imagine how bad it would have been on the previous cycle. Well, actually, it would have been the same quality. Why do I say that? I have a theory. Well, really, it's more similar to a game of Cluedo with a single other person in it, because it is overwhelmingly obvious that a chunk of the Smite dev team were moved to Realm Royale, resulting in Smite's patches needing delays. So yeah, that's terrible, but it's arguably the lesser of two evils in this instance, because this patch also brought the Divine Uprising event. What was it? It was a scam. That's what it was. A complete complete and utter scam performed by charlatans to rob you of your prized pound coins. In normal events, players can just buy whatever skin they want, but in Divine Uprising, Hi-Rez added a chess system, so you had to buy a chance of getting the skin you want. There were three chests of nine items that costed 400 gems per roll, which is also the price of the previous event skins by the way. How did the community react? How do you think? They added gambling mechanics to a pay for what you want system. The collective fury of the community were stronger than opinions on Brexit. A boycott was started and actually lasted a few days, which is impressive considering the way Reddit is, but all this complaining did result in some change. First, the chests were updated to present three random options instead of one, and they now cost 300 gems per roll. People still hated this, so a second update came where you could pay 750 gems for a skin directly, which is awfully overpriced compared to everything else in this game. The best part of this whole debacle was Hyra's accidentally admitting to stuffing their game with filler content. At least they recognized it as such. On the bright side, probably only the whales of this game actually bought into the event, considering the T5 Bologna skin was rubbish anyways. So after being denied money, the next idea they had was to bring back time queues from the old beta days. <sighs> Seems so long ago now. Now, timed queues aren't actually a bad thing, considering that all the players are in the same place at the same time before a match is created. So ideally, the matchmaking system can organise players of equalish skill. This never happened of course, but it's the thought that counts. What was dodgy about this whole change were the queue times themselves. The casual queues were fine, two to three minutes, what you'd expect. But then you scroll down and see that Siege is at 12 minutes for some reason. Why? Like, I get it's not the most popular game mode, but this is unnecessarily long. One argument for this is that Siege's matchmaking was terrible in the first place, pairing four-man teams with new players, as has actually happened to me before, so a longer queue is needed to stop this from happening. One argument against this is that hi purposely made the queue longer to dissuade people from playing the game mode so they had an excuse to remove it, which was actually a hot topic during the year. What do I think? Judging by a player, account's image of each game mode that was being used at the time, we can see that Siege, Rank, Joust, and Duel all had similar counts, and they all had 12 minute queues. This instance of poor design was likely accidental, and they did try to fix the issue. That's why I brought this up. hi do some terrible things, but sometimes it's unintentional. What was most definitely intentional, however, was changing the teams in charge of each project into their own studio. This is where the terrible meme, Titanforge, the developers of 
Smite, or Evil Mojo, the developers of Paladins came from. This was so obviously done to deflect hatred from high res, and it actually worked! I never see people on the Smite Reddit call out high res anymore. No, it's Titanforge now. Pathetic. Maybe even the employees are fed up at this point. I mean, I can't imagine working at- Oh my. Well, that's certainly a colourful way to send your regards. Okay, so what else is there? Uh, death stamps are now a thing. An icon that appears on the ground where you died. I hate this season so much. Oh, and the Vulcan skin. Okay, so every year there's a community skin contest to get a fan design in the game. The other part of this story includes a god called Vulcan who has a meme surrounding him for years about one of his abilities being called a meatball. A Chef Vulcan skin has been requested longer than I've been playing Smite because of this, and in Season 5, hi -Rez announced that it would finally happen. But it would be replacing the skin contest. I just don't get this one. hi -Rez have added widely requested inside jokes like Swagney and Godzilla before, so this really sticks out as some employees just not wanting to bother themselves with a bunch of polls. It's all really strange. And the final change of Season 5 I'll go over. The UI change. Just because you released it in the month of giving does not mean I am happy to receive this cow defecation. The goal of the new UI was to make it both suitable for PC and console, but they somehow failed to meet both of those requirements. Savvy Saw made a fantastic video detailing all the issues of this train wreck, so I'd recommend watching that, but I'll quickly go over the problems here. The colour palette is inconsistent and messy, the layout is inconsistent between sections and some overlap with the other menu options. Navigation between menus is confusing due to the alternating methods of transport, including text buttons, icons, and the escape button. The information presented is lackluster at best, just take a look at the friends list, it doesn't tell you what they're playing, just that they're on smite. Just, just look at it! How did they think this was okay? This is just insulting, a joke, a gag, a ruse, a stage play. I cannot begin to understand why anyone thought this could ever be a positive change, and that they actually had the guts to put it on the playable test server and ask for feedback before pushing it into the live version with no changes. This is the only game company in the galaxy which is unironically at war with its customers. How were we feeling? At this point, if anyone made it this far, I would be surprised if they could feel anything. Do you think hi -Rez changed at all for this season? Do you think there's life on Mars? Season 6, or as I like to call it, Season 5, Part 2, Electric Boogaloo, yes I'm making that joke again and you cannot stop me because it barely changed anything about the game. Also, for some reason, the patch notes for Season 6 were split across three days, but since people only cared about the day balance was showcased, the others were pointless. The only good thing from the patch notes was the addition of cross-progression and cross-play, so no randoms from... other walks of life, shall we put it, can ruin your games too. In all seriousness, it was a good change. Even better that they had the foresight to keep all ranked modes platform exclusive. Couldn't keep themselves from changing the season ticket into a battle pass though. Functionally, it's the same as the ticket of old, but with a free track that gives you garbage, a paid track that gives you garbage recolors, and a prestige track, which is the other half of the battle pass but called something else. The grinds were fine at first, but they just got longer and longer, then shorter again, but I'll get to that one. Whatever. These tumors were going to be added at some point since Paladins got them a year earlier. They're just an incentive to play the game and only this one game because you spent some extra dosh. Not because it's a quality experience or actually fun. Apart from these, the only other thing would be the addition of the Mixer Store. Link your high res and Mixer accounts together and watch streams to get points to spend on those skins. All it led to was a bunch of 24-7 AFK streams for people to put on in the background. Don't feel too bad, it happened in Paladins as well. Moving on through the the year? What could possibly go wrong? Uh oh hi Rez, you dropped your smite event plans to scam people again. Battle of Olympus, which became mathematically the worst event in smite's history. No seriously, someone made a whole event scorer thing based on the skin prices, discounts, total costs, etc etc. Man there are people out there that still spend money on this game. That's seriously funny. Next mess was the community skin contest. Don't worry, there was actually one this time. It's just the concepts that are the problem now, or more specifically, the ones that weren't included. 
A skin concept called Casino Hera was floating around and the community decided it had to win, since it does actually look rather nice. Hyres agreed. In fact, they thought it looked too nice. Get a load of this reasoning. After some heated discussion, the team decided that while Argus was very strong, there weren't enough interesting aspects to Hera's depiction. As Hera is the playable character, it's very important to us that she is the star of any skin. What a terrible excuse. Like, seriously, what were you thinking. What made this all the more better was the release of this Hera skin later in the year. Yeah, because Hera is totally the star here, over Argus being piloted by a kitty cat. Caused about as much drama you would expect from the Smite community at this point, lasted a day and there was barely any. It's sad, just sad at this point, but entirely deserved. If you decided to actually stick with this game after the way hi -res have acted over the years, you deserve every scam, balanced decision and bug that comes your way. No wonder the player base is so toxic. Speaking of bugs, I'm gonna sound like a broken record. The game doesn't work. The friends list is still busted. The newly implemented streamer mode, an option which is meant to hide your identity, shows the player's name under certain circumstances, such as surrendering. Performance has gone down the toilet because I am certain that this game loses a frame every patch. Disconnections are happening constantly. The game is a complete mess of spaghetti code and lack of polish. Perfect example of this biting high res in the behind would be the world's championship of that year. Let's ignore the complete abandonment of the European audience because it was held well past midnight. We'll add in the absolute absence of hype as well, but it's smite, so what can you expect? There were so many technical issues that I'm sure the people who still play this game got secondhand embarrassment. Someone on Team Diginus had their keyboard stop working and no, a reset was not ordered. Another player was having constant freezing issues that apparently caused caused his team to lose, god specific bugs with Persephone in particular being so buggy she was banned from finals. Speaking of the finals, they started with two crashes in a row. I don't know who at Rival did this, but I thank you for the laughs. On top of all that, the spectator mode came into work drunk. I could list all the issues with this biohazard, but I honestly think it's better if Hyres just cast it off a cliff and start again from the ground up. Any issue you could imagine about viewing a smite match dynamically has happened. From making it look like players are lagging to not showing kills, take your pick, it'll be there. I don't know why you'd even play this game competitively anymore. Having prize pools that make the Tekken World Tour blush, there's news constantly of organisations stepping on their players by not paying them, hi -res completely overhauling the changes of the Season 5 SBL by limiting the number of orgs that are competing and hosting all matches in one area. EU boys are real happy now. It just doesn't seem worth it. Smite's community is far too casual for this sort of serious competition to receive any viewership anyways, which is proven by the the declining viewership numbers and a worrying amount of casters, organisations and pro players leaving altogether. So why is it too hard for Smite players to care about their own scene? Two reasons, probably. Teams constantly leaving and being replaced year after year, and a lack of information about the SPL. When are these matches? I could google it, but people are very lazy and that's not the way to get them into your eSport. This stuff needs to be advertised in the game. This is why the season ticket was so good. Maybe improving the ranked experience would also help get people into this stuff, but ranked is still a mess to no one's surprise. Everything I've mentioned prior is still an issue, but multiplied by infinity and it honestly seems like people who play ranked actually lose brain cells. No seriously, we've got pros unironically complaining about Loki. I thought we all agreed he was the pleb filter. Here's a hilarious one about Nox. What, can't you strafe? Or is this just a hunter thing? Or maybe it's Twitter as a platform, because hi -res thought putting out this to the public was a good idea. Graphic design is truly my passion. Okay, what else? Oh yeah, the Odyssey. They thought it would be a good idea to add a buy all option that gave you the T5 skin right away, ruining the usual build up before its release. God, you don't even know what all the stuff in the Odyssey even is yet. Why risk your money on something that you probably won't like? Oh wait, you want to support high res? What a noble cause. Ah, oh, hell's bells, how can it get any worse? We have reached the peak. It can't get any worse than this. Oh, there's so much to talk about. Okay, so let's just get this out the way. Nobody asked for this. Nobody wanted this. If you did, then please seek medical help. 
Now moving on to the collaborations announcement. I have no idea why people were actually excited considering this is being made by high res. While people were getting their hopes up, I was getting all my energy ready for constant mockery of these fools, and lo and behold, I was right. What a surprise. First of all, the skins themselves. Honestly, they look fine. I'm not foaming at the mouth like Darkstalker's got a new game or anything, they're just fine. Yeah, the faces are a little off, but that's the whole anime aesthetic. I will say they are textured like League characters, but whatever, right? The gods that they're on are the more noticeable problem. Ruby being Thanatos is fine, I guess, since they both use scythes. Weiss as Freya is the best pick, honestly. Blake as Amaterasu is terrible, and the only reason she was picked was to make the skins go over a diverse number of classes, rather than fitting the best character, and Yang as Terra, which is also incredibly stupid. I don't watch Ruby. I have negative interest in your waifu trash, but even I know Yang punches people a lot. You know who punches people a lot in Smite? Ravana. In fact, his whole kit is focused around throwing sluggers. Why wasn't he picked? Well, the answer is very simple and feeds into the next problem, the animations, which were completely unchanged for every single one of the skins. The Ruby fandom made the point that their characters do not float very clear with all their autistic rounds which was only drowned out by my roaring laughter because these people actually thought high-res would not take the laziest route possible with these skins. Oh man, this does me just right. Imagine being so blind. You deserve jail time for even suspecting that Hyros would put effort into this event after their track record. Getting scammed isn't enough. You're delusional and must be separated from society. But whatever manpower was put into this rubbish clearly didn't go into the patch itself. You name a problem, and it happened. A god was disabled. Some skins were crashing the game, so they suffered the same fate. Ranked Duel was disabled due to a bug with the bull demon. It was all one very unfunny joke. Worst defender of the whole patch would be an aspect of the balance though, specifically Freya, if you remember me mentioning her. Okay, so Freya is a god that has gone through many reworks, with her most recent one being not well received. So in this patch, which conveniently pushes a skin for her in the battle pass, they decided to revert the recent rework to the one before. What this resulted in was Freya being very overpowered again. They did this for money, you cannot tell me otherwise. Also, I don't know who decided to change the main menu theme into one of the Ruby intro songs, but whoever decided to curse us like this must be forced to 100% Devil May Cry 2 as punishment. <sighs> but that won't take away the pain. All that wasted money, all that wasted time. Maybe it was necessary. A lesson telling us to beware what we put our faith into and when enough is enough. So many people just want Smite to be like the way it was in the good old days. But that's just nostalgia talking. Smite's never had good days. It's always been half-baked and barely playable. What people loved was the concept. They saw potential for this game to become the best in its genre. To have that low skill floor with a high ceiling. To show their friends and have them join in. To play competitively and earn money from something you love. But that didn't happen. Not in the slightest. Why? Well, in case you haven't been listening this whole time, it was due to the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Balance, bugs, polish, and mismanagement. Maybe throw in the community as a riding buddy while you're at it. Smite's been going on for eight years now. Not many games live that long. It's had a good run, but that was in spite of high res, not because of them. It was the community who loved it and kept this game alive this whole time. I could continue to talk about Season 7. I could talk about the new Conquest and Joust map. I could talk about how hi -Rez added a season pass that'll give you all the gods for this year alongside a limited recolor, without there even being a discount for people who own the god pack. I could talk about the addition of Mulan and how her legend was completely cast aside to turn her into a waifu for skin sales. I could talk about the insane lag spikes happening throughout Season 7. I could talk about high res discontinuing the Allied Code, something dedicated to a pro player who died from cancer. I could talk about high res support just being MIA in general. I could talk about the Loki rework and show you how horribly Loki players were treated by the community. I could talk about a lot of things, but I don't want to. I'm tired of Smite. I'm tired of the free to play model. I'm tired of high res. It's... it's... It's just too much now. How are we feeling? At this point, I don't think I could even speak for everyone anymore. How am I feeling? Don't ask. 
I could talk about it for a while. Tell me, as if you could. Anyways, did you really think it would be so easy to escape? None of the others before you could. And neither will you. But before that, I'll let you delude yourself into thinking you're special. 